what will we be covering today? I want to do three things and I want to do them in depth really well. I want to get you to understand company. Company, I'll go a little bit on the company structure and really dissecting the job description, which is very important. The tell me about yourself question, there's so much information out there. And I find that interviews can be so transactional. Have you done this? Tell me about this or this or that. So if you really prepare, tell me about yourself, including the magic ingredient, you really would eliminate so much of those back and forth questions. You will have positioned yourself immediately. And I will cover uh, really positioning yourself. This is where um, I really go with each individual client, look at the job description, look at what they're doing and begin to pull out your core competencies. And of course, I'm gonna leave a little bit of time for questions and answers. So please, please do not hesitate. If, as I'm talking, a question comes up in your mind. There is no silly question. Just don't hesitate to type it through. I'll pause throughout and then come back and make sure that all questions are answered. So a little introduction uh, about myself for those who have not engaged. My actual full name is Natalia Zahra Polishchuk Mohammed. I didn't choose any of them. I was gifted to them through my parents. I am half Ukrainian and half Somali, really went to many different schools, traveled across the world, lived, have lived most of my life in the UK, but I call Kenya, Nairobi and Diani my home right now for almost over eight years. Um, I am a specialist. Sometimes I am looked at as a HR. Oh, you are in HR. I only do one element of HR recruitment um, and I'm a specialist in this area. When I say I have interviewed between 18 to 15,000 people, hired over 1,000 to 1,200 across 70 countries, I'm not exaggerating. Um, I tend to find recruitment is managed quite badly, so it's very transactional. CVs are pushed. Uh, you can't really see who a person is in the CVs are two-dimensional. Neither can the candidate see from a job description how dynamic the team is, what kind of culture they have, what is their dress code. So recruitment really is, is, is not necessarily an easy industry to kind of work in, but I really love people. I love working with people. And I will say openly, my passion is anybody that has melanin, okay? As long as you have melanin, you have my attention and I will headhunt you. So let me move on. So just work. Um, we uh, were founded, we started in September 2017, so we are coming up into our seventh year. Um, they say once a company has gone past the first five years, then your, your kind of projection or your security of survival is more secure. And I have to say the majority, really the main reason I am here today is through referrals. I believe that if you do a good job, referrals will come. So what do we do at Just Work? We do three things. Recruitment. Um, this is, as I said, my passion. I spend at least 80% of my time in recruitment across all of Africa. Um, we have done several outplacement programs when companies make, uh, unfortunately, in this new industry, shifting world of work, companies need to restructure on a regular basis. So when they are making um, senior individuals or individuals across the industry redundant, um, I come in and really support them in getting that next job from end to end of the programs. We have done placements for some large clients from Ernest & Young, Sanofi, Tallow Oil, APSA, etc. And of course, careers. So under the careers arm, we have, I would say, about four pillars. So we do keyword-based, ATS-friendly CV and LinkedIn optimization. I have an e-learning platform where we provide career development from LinkedIn coaching, interview preparation, et cetera. And a small amount of time, only a small amount, I take a, a, a small number of clients on a monthly basis. But once I take you on, <coughs> excuse me, I then really support you in, in getting where you need to. When it comes to our interview support, we have the e-learning platform that has six modules. And then I, if I am to do any executive interview coaching, I really need you to watch the three hours before because that provides the biggest mind shift. So some of the content you will see today 
uh, is really what you will find also in our e-learning platform. Why choose us? Okay, I will leave it to you. <laughs> now, just to give you a quick update, sort of FYI for the next events, um, end of January, I am doing a really interesting uh, event, which is really going to talk about the six types of generative AI. We've been hearing of ChatGPT. We've done a session already on how to use ChatGPT. It's available on our YouTube channel. But ChatGPT is only one of six generative AI. So what does the new era of augmented workforce look like? What are going to be the new ways of working? Where is the human machine partnership? How is the new operating model going to look like? So that's going to be an interesting one. And then for February, um, I am going to do a good session on body language. But I'm not going to do body language. You see, body language is used a lot. Or how do you spot a liar? How do you spot deception? Whereas for me, body language is getting to understand what messages you are giving out to others. Is how are you communicating with your body language, which consists about 60% of non-spoken language, word less communication. And we communicate a lot. So this is not just understanding basic body language, adapters, regulators, and many other factors. Very interesting, hope you will attend. And then obviously for March, 8th of March, International Women's Day, I have found women really internationally, consistently manage their careers from uh, imposter syndrome, regardless of what level they have reached, really all the way to what, what motivates women, why they don't necessarily job hop, and what is it that pushes them to drive their careers. So these are some of our upcoming events. Okay. Let's get started. Unleash your interview potential. Now, um, most of us, when we are applying for jobs, we tend to just uh, read the job description, read the job title, and just assume that the role is going to be big just because the job title may be senior, etc. I recommend highly, even before you actually apply for a job, that you carry out some of the most important basic research that you need to do and understand what company you are going for. Company vital statistics, structures, their location, their HQ, what industry they're in, all of that makes such a substantial difference. So reading just the job title and the job description is not enough to truly tell you how much of a responsibility, how uh, strategic the role may be or how regional or anything else so do not just assume just by the job title alone and the job description that that's all the role looks fantastic you need to put the whole company into context so you can research linkedin uh, you can research companies in a variety of ways i use wikipedia a great deal because it gives you information about that company's history, who owns them, who are their competitors, how long, any acquisition that may have gone through. When you look at Glassdoor, of course, we need to be careful because we we tend to be much more ha happier to leave a review when we are complaining rather than when we are very happy. So always take reviews and validate them where possible. But Glassdoor is the one place where we can begin to leave a lot of reviews. LinkedIn, I will actually take you through briefly how you can do some of your search on LinkedIn because most people don't understand how powerful of a search engine and the amount of information that you can get on LinkedIn. And of course, Google, most of us know, is just Googling it. So, so when it comes to an organization, the first thing that I want you to do is really understand where is that company's HQ? Where do they come from? That company, wherever that company comes from, that country's culture will be embedded in the company. If the company is Chinese, very unlikely to have extra expenses to put in when you are in sales. If you are working for a German company, you will tend to find a lot of their, even their employment law seems to go regionally. If we work for an American company, a French company, so understand, where is that company's HQ? That country will then govern the culture of that company. 
Also, what we know is that over the last, say, 20 years, um, maybe even before, but I would say predominantly over the last 20, 25 years, companies have started to change their operating models or their operating locations due to cost. What do I mean by that? Shared services. We centralize operations that are not necessarily repeated. So, for example, if I take Coca-Cola and I look at Coca-Cola 20 years ago, Coca-Cola was in all of East Africa, but in each country it would have had a local HR, a local law, legal person, a local marketing, whereas now any of these operations, especially in finance, any kind of operational role, we tend to centralize them. So an example that I also make is, is uh, when I, I worked for Oracle UK and then I came to Oracle Kenya, and I would get fantastic senior finance profile saying, I would love to work for Oracle, but we don't have a finance department there. So we need to understand where is their operating location? Where do people like you, the job that you are applying, which country are they actually currently based? And of course, the industry. Now, the industry sometimes, how do you judge and look at industries? First of all, it can be a traditional industry. Then we have new industries where technology has merged with traditional industry. We can see this in banking with fintech. We have agritech, it's moving. So industries are shifting. Some are more traditional, like the construction industry. Some are much more fast paced. And we also need to be careful to use words like even FMCG fast moving consumer goods. There isn't an industry as such. Those big umbrellas always have subcategories. So FMCG will have food and beverage, consumer goods, consumer electronics. We need to be also careful when we are looking at industry only to say, oh, it's in manufacturing or it's in retail. Well, retail, let's say hospitals are retail. Manufacturing shifts substantially whether you are manufacturing pharmaceuticals or you are manufacturing or growing plants etc but one of the most important aspect when you are doing your company vital statistics is the size the size fundamentally shifts and changes substantially what you do especially whatever line of business you are in i'm going to come back to this slide so i'm going to move um to this slide and then go back to the size to explain it a little bit more all companies regardless of their sizes will have these i kind of separated them into three key pillars the first one is global functions support functions operational functions this is anything that helps the company operate they they may provide savings they may provide better efficiency in how a company operates but they never bring revenue they spend it you are talking HR, finance, legal, procurement. I put marketing with an asterisk because marketing really sits in where this middle phase is, which is where the revenue grows. The management, the sales tend to be more of decision makers. So any role where there is that revenue growth happening, you tend to have more authority, more decision making. And then the third pillar, really that the delivery and execution is whatever that company is specialized in. So if they are in construction, the, the delivery of that business will then be the builders, the electrician, the plumbers. If we are going into I don't know, a taxi company, this will be the drivers, the mechanics, uh, people who are actually delivering that. And we need to be really careful in understanding this because sometimes you cannot assume that, for example, finance only or HR only sits in the global support or operational functions. Some companies offer solutions that are, so within the delivery, there will be a HR person that, for example, let's say it's a big IT consulting, then the, the, the recruitment or HR may not necessarily sit as part of their internal global function, but sit in their operational one. And that's the important part to really begin to dissect your company and understand where your role is coming from. Now, if I go back uh, to, to the size of the company, imagine I have a company of 10 people. When it comes now to the HR, do I need a permanent HR person? No. A permanent finance person? No. A permanent legal, a permanent procurement? Or, no, I don't. 
I tend to then use consultants who will come in, etc. Imagine I now have a company with 100 employees. Now I am going to have a HR person, but they might have one or two direct reports at a junior level, but that HR person is going to do everything under the umbrella of HR from uh, appra appraisals, disciplinary, recruitment, onboarding HR system, compensation and benefit, uh, employee relations, etc. In finance, if you are working for a company of a size of 100, you are likely to be doing many functions under the finance umbrella. So you might be doing the accounts payable, accounts receivable, balance sheet, all of the financial management, reconciliation on a monthly basis, payment of the taxation, etc. But you will also be doing the strategic finance, which is um, budgeting, uh, pricing, anything to do with, with managing where the growth is planning, etc. Now imagine I have a company with 10,000 employees. Now under each function, it each under the umbrella, each pillar becomes its own department. So if I have an organization with 10,000 employees and I go to HR, there will be a department just of recruitment, a department just for compensation and benefit, a department just for employee relations, etc. So the size of the organization makes a very big difference in whether you become a specialist or a generalist. In Africa, we do have a little bit more combination. I mean, in Africa, we are more generalist. Why? The biggest employers are SMEs, uh, mid to SMEs. And even when we get the big multinationals coming in, their departments are not as big as in their HQ. So if I'm hiring, for example, a lawyer in UK or a lawyer in Kenya, the one in the UK, because the operation is bigger, there is more population, I will hire specialists in the legal area. Whereas when I am hiring in East Africa or parts of Africa, they are likely to be covering regional roles, therefore more generalist as a rule of thumb. Now, what I'm going to do is very briefly show you how to use LinkedIn in terms of doing your search. When we come to LinkedIn, this little search field is a magical field. Absolutely, it's one of my favorite, is even better than Google. When you go in here, you can either type the company name, so say Coca-Cola, and it comes up, or you can do a company search. Please remember that LinkedIn does not create your profile or anybody else's profile. LinkedIn is just the platform. So always, always pay due diligence to the numbers that you are seeing. So, <coughs> excuse me, here's the company. So this is Coca-Cola. When you are beginning to look at a company, yes, of course, you can look at their home, about, jobs, but I want you to start looking at first people. You can look at people in two places. One, where it says the number of employees, or two, people under here. When you are looking at people, do not assume, remember, LinkedIn did not, if you, when you started to work for your current company, you went in there, updated, connected the company. So we can never assume that there's this, this number is 100% correct. Most of the time is a good indication. Unless a company is, for example, in manufacturing, you will not find the people in the warehouse on the floor actually trying to, to, to come on LinkedIn. What can you see here? You can see where they are based, which country they're based. If you do next here, you begin to see what are their operations? How many people do they have? Sales, marketing, business development, and sales and business development may be similar. The same to finance and accounting may be similar. But let's say that you are looking at specifically at HR. You can simply click on the HR and it now will break down the 1,757 people and show you that HR distribution. You can also add additional fields here to add job titles, location. So I can say, I want to know anybody who is in Kenya working for Coca-Cola and the HR. And the moment you've done that, you just scroll to the bottom and it will tell you all the people that are below here. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my presentation. Um, I have a lot more information for you to 
really know how to search LinkedIn, how to become headhuntable on LinkedIn, what are the most important fields, but that's not for today, so I will continue. Let's move on, dissecting, so do your research on the company, understand where the people like you, whether you're in finance, marketing, sales, wherever you are, try and see where else do people like me sit right now? Which country are they distributed? And try and also understand the history of the job role. Is it a replacement? Is it a new headcount? If it's a replacement, how long was the last person there? Why did they leave? All of this information is very important for you to understand. Now, for me, the job description is a holy grail. Now, not all job descriptions are made very well, and they are not always very clearly done. Sometimes people will just take copy paste, plaster a few things and put it out. But what I do say is, when you are reading a job description, please bear in mind these three steps. They are very critical in understanding how you are dissecting the job. So the first one is you create the strategy, you design the strategy, you develop the strategy, or whatever it is. And the words can vary, but it's really about you are creating, designing, developing. Step two is implementing, executing, delivering, maintaining. And then three is where you are measuring, reviewing, reporting, and potentially redesigning. Not all job descriptions, even those that have a senior job title, will have the create and the implement and the measure. The smaller the company and the more regional, you may have that. But once the company is very large, the decisions, let's say you are in marketing in Samsung, the decisions is made of creativity, of the slogan, of the logo, or whatever it is for that year is made back in their HQ. And even though your role may sound very senior and very regional, what you are doing predominantly is implementing, executing, and delivering. You are not actually, you may contribute to some extent. So when you are dissecting the job description, it's really important that you understand these keywords. Really be able to dissect, are you really doing the strategic element or are you just executing the strategy? Are you doing any of the measuring and reviewing? If you can get all three done, et cetera, is a good way of evaluating a job description. Here, I have a couple of job descriptions here. I'm just gonna read out aloud. What we tend to focus when we are reading our job titles is more, for example, responsible for the success of performance and development. We look at the word performance and development. I would say, look at the words responsible. Responsible does not necessarily, is not telling me you are creating, it's telling me more you are maintaining. You are prepare action plan by individuals as well as team for effective search of sales leads. Propose and establish new partnership. It's these key words, those in the three that are really, really critical to understand from support the creation and implementation, assist in developing market campaigns, collaborate with senior, mon help, monitor, contribute. When you are dissecting your job description, you first wanna understand, are you doing step one? Are you doing step two or are you doing step three? Or is it one and three? Or is it just the middle part or is it all three? Be very, very clear when you are dissecting the job description. Also, when you are dissecting the job description, what you begin to get out of there is, what is it that they are looking for you to do? Some job descriptions will tell you what technology they are using. We want you to say in finance, they want you to be familiar with SAP ERP or Oracle uh, ERP or whatever it may be. So we begin to pull out. So when it says here, conduct review with all internal teams to build more effective communications. So what is the sentence telling me is work with internal teams. Even though you may not have everything that job description is telling you, we can pull out what we have previously done to align to what they're looking for. 
when you are dissecting the job description, not only are you looking for the one, two, three, but you really are beginning to pull out what is it that they are looking for you to do. If I look at um, developing and deploying marketing strategies to achieve sales and marketing plans, you now have to think of specific examples of where you have actually deployed them. And one of the things that I, I'm, I'm going to be cautious also in time, because I have a few things to cover, is any time we are explaining our own experience, you have to start using visual language. Visual language allows you to quantify and qualify, quantify and qualify. So if I give you an introduction of myself to simply say, I have been a recruiter for the last 18 years, hiring across Africa, Europe, and Middle East, hiring from graduate all the way to senior level, great. This you have not quantified by saying, I have interviewed 15,000 people, hired over a thousand across 70 countries in Africa, Europe, and Middle East. You need to begin to quantify and qualify so that we can visualize it, we can understand it, we can put it into context. Here's another job description to provide in depth financial analysis, analytical support to the VP. Commercial, so here is telling me you need to bring me the financial data to help the VP and the sales leaders to make better decisions so that we can gain that. Manage annual planning. Manage is more maintain, is more execute, is more implement. So really don't just focus on the, oh, I am going to be doing the annual planning. Well, are you going to be creating it or are you going to be just implementing it? So understand some of those keywords. Now, um, the magic ingredient and tell me about yourself. <laughs> Having done so many interviews, the one thing I will say is, is that for most of my clients or any headcount that I have ever worked with, I usually provide no more than five candidates per headcount. Three candidates are usually exactly what the client needs. And what I do is I bring in one or two, a little bit more junior, a little bit more, maybe it might be a side move, sort of, it might be a, a, a career shift for them or a career change for them. And I know that they have the competencies, but the managers are ticking off what is it that they are looking for. And I don't, I cannot explain how often the individuals that are a little bit more junior always, always perform much better than the more senior. Why is that? It's because they see this as an exciting opportunity. So let's go and dig deeper a little bit more. Each one of us must always have a long version of tell me about yourself and a short version of tell me about yourself. And you are not your job title. You are not your industry. You are not your education. You need to understand your core value and your value add. What, imagine you are a hand cream. What we typically do in an interview, even on a CV, is we read the ingredients. Ingredients. Ingre this is what we have, the education. Whereas what we need to focus on is what does the hand cream actually do? What is the value add that it actually gives us? So it is very important that you begin to build this tell me about yourself. You see, when we go to interviews, we tend to prepare in our minds. When I do interview coaching, the first thing I do is begin to dissect the job description and then pull out your core competency by going through each job. What have you done? What system have you used? What did you achieve? And by putting all of that together, depending on what role you are putting yourself forward, this is how you are going to do that. So I say seven minutes, depends how many years of experience you have. And I believe this is the most important part. You can even create a presentation. Um, I have, as I said, lots and lots of information on, on the actual program itself is three and a half hours. But when it comes, when it comes to tell me about yourself, it's, really important that it's not about you listing what you have done. Yes, that is important. 
why we want to know, have you achieved this before? And based what you have previously done, can, we are now more sure what you are going to do in the future. But in the tell me about yourself, you, you're not only putting what you have previously done, but focus on the value of what you are going to do for that company, what your skills will do. So in your presentation of tell me about yourself is giving the client a vision of what value you will do whilst they're very busy asking you, have you managed people? Have you um, um, built a new product in a new territory? Have you reviewed previous processes? Have you implemented a new thing? It's really, really important that you give in any interview, not just what you have done, but what you can potentially do for them. That's an important part. So now, let's go through in tell me about yourself. I have three steps in that. You see, we remember, you see, this is again going back to personal branding. When we are interviewing, do not assume that every person who is interviewing you knows how to interview. Most, the first thing I do with my hiring manager is train them on how to interpret answers. Most people tend to interview with their own subjectivity. If they've traveled, if they've known the world, if they know more, they will understand your context where you are coming from. So when you are telling about yourself, most people start with, my name is, well, we know your name, we've invited you. And a lot of ladies will start saying, I am married with three kids, etc." I don't believe your personal life has anything to do and people should not ask, you know, whether what your family status is. This is why it's important when you are telling me about yourself, you need to start with a memorable story. So for example, I was interviewing an accountant and I said, tell me about yourself. You know, how come you are in accounting? He said, well, tell you the truth. I, from a kid, I've always wanted to be a pilot. You know, from the time I saw the plane going over, I was so fascinated. But once I grew up, I realized that I was terrified of heights. And my father, the accountant, I really had very little choice. Versus someone who said, you know, my parents were teachers. I grew up with books constantly. I was always in a bookstore. So for me, having to do research and constantly go out there. Or for example, my own story. I have a degree in fashion. And I can start by saying, you know, when I, when I left school and I had to decide what to do at university, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I chose fashion because I'm a very creative person and I chose a, quite a structured degree in fashion. Um, when I completed my four-year degree, um, my first job was actually in HR. I fell in love with, with the actual function and I have continued there throughout all of my career. That beginning of the story begins to color you, begins to give you a sense of who you are. If you are talking is, you know, I am Natalia, I am married with one child, I have worked, at, don't be in, in that transaction, bring that little bit more personality. So how you tell your story, okay? And if, if you've got, let's say, seven minutes, do not spend two minutes telling this story. 30 seconds to 45 seconds is a long period. Make sure that you do not utilize, and it can be up to seven minutes. You can shorten it even to five if you wanted to. I said seven, really seven to 10 minutes. And if you are doing a really good job, people will be listening, etc., and paying attention. Actually, I forgot one thing to mention. When you are looking at the job description, try and see what keywords they are using. Focused business plans. If they are using partnering, licensing, joint venture agreements, try and bring in the language that you see in the job description, also in when you are telling your story. Because we are used to certain keywords and we are listening for keywords. We are scanning for keywords. So whenever you are going about to tell me about yourself, Start with a really important story, personalize what you've done, explain why your career, bring that passion into it. So that's the phase one. Phase two, what is it that we want to know about you? And this is really important. This is where you need to sit down with pen and paper, 
for each job and begin to write everything down. So we want to know where was your first job, how long you were in that job, what was the context, what were you doing, what was the operation? Just to say, oh, I was doing, uh, my first job was at JD Edwards where I remained for two years working in the HR department. Much better explanation is JD Edwards had the second largest um, offices in the UK. We were a team of 300. I supported everything in HR from recruitment to learning and development, all the way to surveying, to disciplinaries, and actually handing out the communications. Visual language is so important. You need to begin to quantify and qualify. And, and what I recommend you use is, there are so many acronyms out there. I use the CAR acronym. C for context, A for action, R for result. What was the context? What was the action? What was the result? And please, guys, this is a big please. Do not use constantly the word, we develop a program, we launch the program. I don't know what part of we we are. When I dig deeper, it turns out, oh, I developed the program, I delivered. Be careful in not using the word, we then uh, did the research and then we developed. Do not use the word we. They're not interviewing the company, they're interviewing you. So when you are going through your JD, depending on the number of years of experience you have, if you've got five or six jobs, remember, nobody's gonna interview you for the jobs that you've done at the beginning of your career. What they are interested in is your current role, the last five to seven years. So out of your seven minutes, you want to make sure that you focus a lot more on what you are currently doing. <laughs> now, you go through each job description. I was there for five years. During that five years, I actually grew into three different roles. Please, when you are doing your pitch of tell me about yourself, do not explain away your experience. Tell a story. Do not say, and then my manager left and an opportunity came up and I was then put up for it and I then interviewed for it and then here I am. There is no need to explain away. You are pitching yourself to say, after two years, I got promoted um, and then I took on the role where the more responsibility were added, etc. Also here, if you have read the job description well and you know that they are looking for you to go either into a new territory or the one they are looking for you to go elsewhere, you are going to pull out that more than the others. And in each one of our jobs, there are things that, if you say, I do, I do reporting, well, how many reports? How often do you do them? How do you collect the data? How do you do that? We, in the car context, uh, uh, C for context, A for action, R for result, we only focus on result. If I ask an accountant, tell me something that you have achieved in the last six months that you are proud of. Oh, I made a cost saving, 20% cost saving with our suppliers. That's just the result. That does not give me context. So I am managing 24 suppliers in four countries. They all have different terms and conditions. Action. What I did is to renegotiate the terms and conditions and change the payment date as a result this was, we saved 20%. So when you are going through each one of your experience, how long you were there, what you achieved, what you did, we also want to know why you left. And again, in an interview, always make it, especially if you are leaving in your current job, why do you want to leave? Do not put focus on why you have left, put focus on what excites you about the role. Well, it's not that I'm actively looking, or it may be that you are actively looking, and even if you had a very difficult time with your previous job, please be careful. My manager was a very difficult manager. You can say, you know, you need to be smart with your words. That's why I say, put the phone in front of you. Once you've dissected, practice, practice, practice. By the time you've done this two or three times and you've written it out and you have your pointers, you will get your pitch to perfection. So pay attention to your storytelling. And then the final part, most people, when you've done, okay, you've now come to your final experience, what you have currently done. 
what most people do is go and say, and the reason I am suitable for this role is because I have this experience, I have this knowledge, and I have this, therefore I know I can deliver the job. Well, you don't know that. You don't know what we need. You don't know, we are just making some assumptions. And this is where the magic ingredient comes. Do not make things up, but by looking at your own preferences, the number one magic ingredient is first about the job. What really excites me about this role is an opportunity to be able to grow a market, um, this, you know, grow a market that will have a substantial impact. What really the magic ingredient is excitement, is positive energy. And you tend to find the more senior individuals, you know, they don't want to come across, yes, I have done this, I can do this, I'm very competent, yes. What they lack is that positive magic ingredient in trying to say, you know, what, what I'm really interested specifically about this job is the fact that I'll be able to, having done something like that on a smaller scale, I'm really, really interested in this area. You can find many things about the job. The second thing is the company and the brand. And this becomes even more important the more senior you go towards the last of the interviews. So if I'm interviewing for Just Work and my team have interviewed and they've selected somebody, when they come in and I'm saying, so what do you know about Just Work? It's not just about reading a company, oh, you were established in 2017, you do recruitment, outplacement, etc. I like that, the fact that you know that. But what is important to me is to say, you know, your brand really focuses on Africa and the growth of Africa. You know, I really believe that this is a continent that needs to grow. So you need to al align your prefer personal preferences to some value of the brand. What is the brand stand for? How well established they are? Align them to yourself, to your own passions. Apart from the company, you can also do Maybe you're going to work for an NGO and that NGO is providing financial inclusion to single mothers that are young. You know, you can then say, you know, growing up, one of my cousins or aunties or I have seen close family members go through this process. You are aligning it to yourself. Therefore, it becomes very authentic, very believable. So the magic ingredient is to say what excites you about the job. What is it about the brand, the company? And then what is it that they do? What are they solving? What is their solution helping? Do not make things up, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> align them. This is really important that you actually align yourself. And I assure you, when you finish doing your pitch, you know, I have got 12 years experience. Over that experience I've worked, industries are important. This is why doing your pitch, if that company is looking for your industry, you'll say, I've worked in manufacturing, I know A, B, C, D, and F, whatever else it may be. So preparation in telling your story, begin with your storyline, tell your story from the start to how long you were in each role, what have you achieved, why you left, what was your motivation. And this is not, remember, interviews are elimination process. They are listening for any risks. What is he going to say? What is she going to say that alarm bells that are going to go off? And remember, people who are interviewing you, hiring managers, they carry their own baggage. Hiring managers, they hire very subjectively. I cannot explain enough. When I, I, when I take a brief, I dissect the hiring manager. If his head is moving like this, I look for a candidate whose head is moving like this. It's so, so important, but also in the interview process, what is important in the magic ingredient, apart from that positive energy, is also building the rapport. And the rapport is basically, if a hiring manager is speaking very slowly and they are taking their time, you try and mirror that. Mirroring is a lot in, and we do that automatically. In fact, the body language will do that. I do this a lot in interviews. I want to see how much people are mirroring me, how much they're looking to build rapport. So sometimes I'll sit back in my chair and after a bit, I will lean forward. And as I'm leaning forward, you will see the person begins to lean forward. You will tend to find if a manager's got their hips up and you'll see one of them, they'll put their hips up. We do mirroring 
to sort of say, I'm here, you know, whether it's a head tilt, whether it's a nod, but hiring managers hire subjectively. You can never ever go to an interview without knowing who is interviewing you. Please, for the life of me, you don't know who is interviewing you, how long they interview, who will be there, is there anything you need to prepare? Whilst they will have their own agenda, you are the one, it's your job to make sure that they have understood you. It is your job that you have built that report. The mirroring, it's so, so important. Also, commonalities. The more you know about your hiring manager or who is interviewing you, the more you can position. Because if I come from Kakamega, I'm interviewing somebody from Kakamega. Ah, if I am a Lua and you are a Lua, ah, if we studied in the same university, ah, the more similarities we have, the more things in common we have, the more I think, ah, you are like me, therefore I trust you more. So positive energy, meaning you are interested in aspects of the job. You like our aspects of the brand and what the company or what they are actually doing in terms of their product, but also that smile. Like, for example, I am a person that speaks very fast, as you can see. When I'm interviewing and then I get a candidate who is, let me take my time and tell you about myself. I'm scribbling already on the paper. I have no patience for it. So report building can happen if you are doing face to face whether you are tilting your head and nodding, which is your adapters to say that, you know, I am listening to you. Slow down your voice, try and mirror as much as possible where you can. Okay, I'm running out of time. I'm gonna go on to the pillars. Now, the pillars. I've decided to put an example here because I find that when I use this example, you cannot apply to all of this to yourselves. Trust me, this is where I come in because it's like oh i'm like this but so this is a client it's a lady who has spent 24 25 years in the banking industry starting from a teller from desk moved to back office operations became a branch manager moved to another bank began to take sales over uh, sme lending etc moved to another bank and took over a more of a regional role so her pillars do not change Pillars do not change. Your job titles can. What is she essentially? She's sales and sales operation manager in a B2C context. <laughs> if this lady remains in the banking industry, her job titles, her headline, what value add she's putting in is head of high net worth, head of SME lending. If she goes into a fintech organization, her job title will be sales and operation manager. If she goes into an insurance, her job title will be head of medical cover, head of corporate life assurance. But her core pillars do not change. If you are going into a management job, or even if you are not going into a management role, there will be the people management pillar. And I'm going to break down people management a little bit more. For example, here, let me go to the next slide. Under people management, you can have direct reports and you put the job titles here. And in each job, if you are going to a job where you will be managing people, you will say, OK, you have four experiences, but you started to manage people in your first or maybe your second. So as you are telling here, you say, here's where I started to have my direct reports. So under people management, you have direct reports and indirect reports. These are people who help you do your job. You, you know, you can have many indirect reports. It means a lot of team play. Then you have internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. So if I go to people management as the first pillar here, each pillar you have to show you can do end to end of that. I can interview them. I can onboard them. I can hire them. I can train them and develop them. I can put them on a non-performance. I can train them to succession planning and I can fire them. And as you are storytelling about my style, you can say, this is where I started to manage people. My way of managing is, um, what is your management style? This is where they will not need to ask those questions. In all jobs, you will have direct, indirect reports. You will have internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. Even though your job may be even an office manager, you still have suppliers as external to manage. So all of us have a people management. 
And as we are taking each one of our work experience, we have to pull up those competencies. Also, many of us have an operations element. And we do not get hired in operations. You do not, but operations tends to have four sub pillars. First is operational excellence. This is processes, procedures. Even if you are manager, if you are part of a department, whether you are in sales, whether you are in finance, in whatever line of business, we will have internal and sometimes external processes, procedures. So we all have a pillar in operational excellence. We also have compliance, regulatory, anything legal, risk. This is also internal and external. And in your job, as you are telling, this is an important part to say, creating the processes, making sure that they're followed through, etc. Not all of us, but we also have a financial branch. Financial meaning whether you are doing petty cash, you may not be the decision maker or a financial signing of the checks, but you still have some financial responsibility, whether you are creating budgets, reviewing budgets, whatever else it may be. And then under operations, we also have technology. Technology, I split them into two areas, um, and that is Internet of Things and then industry specific technology. So let me use myself as an example. First, I have good knowledge of Internet of Things, um, collaborative platforms, um, um, Dropbox, uh, Microsoft Office, social media platforms. This is Internet of Things. Then my industry as a recruiter, I have very deep knowledge in the world three most used human capital HCM systems, Taleo, Workday, Success Factor. I also am very, very familiar with all of the technology used in testing for reasoning or whatever else it may be. I am also very good at database or the candidate life management. We all have that uh, kind of knowledge. Then if your pillar is in sales, in this case, the end to end of the pillar would be from market segmentation, customer identification, identifying, developing new products, sitting with finance to create a value proposition, sitting with marketing, creating the customer journey, sales, go-to, etc. And then, of course, you can add industry specialization. So this is one of the cool things we do. By dissecting and pulling out all this information from the job description, you are then able to write these up in your visual language to be able to do that. So really, tell me about yourself. Practice that as much as you can identify the value add that they are looking for use the words or even acronyms or whatever they're using in their job description use it for yourself as well and again give them a vision of what you will add you see if somebody came to me interviewing at just work and they said it doesn't matter what plan you will never have a perfect plan for me who sat in just work and thought of all the possibilities that I can possibly do, partnership and collaboration. But the idea that you say, what I envision for just work is creating more of this. So giving your hiring manager the vision of what your skills will do for them. Don't just focus on what you have done, but show them what you will do, how you will do it. And when you are presenting a strategy, people will say, well, if I show them my strategy, they will use it and then not use me. Then what you have failed to do is make yourself integral. You are the strategy. And then I am going to do this and I am going to deliver that. Therefore, you make it, even the strategy is attractive. Then you are the catalyst for them to be able to do that. And then go beyond your skills, passion, why you are interested in the role, especially when you are going to the more senior profiles so just to finish up i think i'm running a little bit late okay how can we help after this we can do a number of different things for you we can test your cv your linkedin we have several free sign up courses you can book 30 minutes career consultation where you are at we can support you if it comes to interviews if you have gone to interviews many times and you just don't not getting any follow-ups or salary negotiation you know you're always getting that lower offer i actually have a free unit you can sign up which 
um, six modules of this uh, interview preparation. The last one is salary negotiation. If you complete our form, we'll give you access for two weeks, you can watch it. You know, maybe you've not been to an interview for a while, or you've just been called and you want to, there's a panel interview. This is what I would say genuinely one of the best investments you can do. It will put so much into context for you. And even after you watched it, if you want to set up a half an hour and say, now I have further questions, we can definitely do that for you. So on the e-learning, our Just Careers, we have LinkedIn coaching. My, my most recommended product is Masterclass. Masterclass is almost eight hours. There's nothing you will not know after this. From creating a digital footprint on LinkedIn, managing your brand, um, to really, really dissecting the industry and then the future of work. So you can sign up for the uh, Art of Salary Negotiation. Um, we will send you a short survey after we've finished. There will be links on there. You can just contact us directly. We've also got another free course, which is personal branding. Um, we can test your CV. Um, you complete the forms, your LinkedIn. What we will give you is um, results that show you not just what percentage. Let's say you've just seen a job and you want to really apply for it. In fact, I always run one of these for any clients I do interview preparation because the report begins to tell me what keywords are missing from your profile. So what you will get is a comprehensive, detailed report on how to interpret your results.